And uh, from a very young age, Mark worked on the family farm with his father and uncle, where he learned the ins and outs of agriculture and running a business. Uh, during that time, Mark developed a strong passion for farming and livestock production. After school, Mark started to work full-time on the family farm. The Nelsons raised corn, soybeans, cattle, and hogs. With Mark's knowledge of swine production, he sought out an opportunity with a company called Absolute Swine Insemination and became the North American distributor for the company. He still holds this position today. In 2011, Mark and his wife, Corinne, along with Mark's cousin, Jeff, and his wife, Jarita, started a new and exciting business venture. The team founded their own aquaculture business, calling it Iowa's First. The family-owned fish farm is located in Blairsburg, Iowa. And to tell you more about it, Mark Nelson. So, <clears throat> I'm uh, not used to getting up in front of people and talking. I'm probably more, like I was just telling these guys over here, it's like, I can get in a tractor and just sing to myself and nobody knows I'm saying or doing anything, so. But, uh, and I'm not a very good singer. So, <clears throat> um, with that, I'll start, I think. So, <clears throat> the story of how it goes, we had a sow unit, and Jeff and I had a lot of conversations for a year or so that it sat empty, and uh, we were like, what can we do with this? And uh, being in the swine production, I was at the Iowa Poor Congress and uh, doing my little thing there, and the show got slow, and Cable Bay had some pictures of fish, and that's kind of where the whole idea came <clears throat> for raising fish, whatever, so. Um, so Jeff and I came up with the idea and we thought about it for a long time. We traveled probably for two years going all over the United States, um, from the East Coast to the South, everywhere, trying to learn everything we could learn about aquaculture. And uh, we met Rick Sheriff with Opposing Flow Technologies and we came up with his design. And I remember going to the World Aquaculture Show before we even really met Rick. And that's, it's going to be in New, or New Orleans. That's where it is again this year. That's where it was a couple years ago. And if anybody's ever interested in getting into aquaculture, I really highly recommend going to the World Aquaculture Show. It, um, there's a lot of information just like today and you can do your own research, like Al Patton says, you know, you, you have to be comfortable with what you're doing. And it was very intimidating going to the show, you know, walking through there the first time and not have made any decisions. It, um, you look at all the different equipment there, and, but over time, we came up with the idea of which tank we wanted to go with. And like the old saying goes, you know, you're not a real fish farmer till you lose a million fish, well, you know, we always thought, oh, we're, we're not going to go down that road because we're going to do all this research ahead of time and we got it all figured out, you know, and we haven't lost a million fish or anything, but there's, there's some stories to be told that we probably don't have time all day long to talk about. But <clears throat> we went down to Keel Fish Farms and we started off with hybrid striped bass. And down there, they'll turn the fish loose, it's fry into these big ponds. And uh, then they'll bring them into these purge tanks before you load them up. And we had a truck, rider truck. We bought the live haul tanks from Keel Fish Farms and brought our first batch back. And it's a 13-hour drive one way. We'll bring them back six-inch long fingerlings and put them in the tanks and unloaded them at the fish farm. It went along really good working. The fish were growing incredibly fast. So when we first start off, you start off with about 12,000 fish in a tank. As they grow, the biomass gets bigger and bigger. Two months time, you split these fish into two tanks. And you take the small ones, put them in one tank, and little ones in another. So we had to make our own greater tank, or graders, and aluminum tanks that we used the forklift to go from tank to tank and everything was going really good. 
what we were doing there, it takes about two years outdoors to grow that same fish that we were doing in like six months, you know, because even in Arkansas, they'll get a skip of snow or ice on the ponds. When that water temperature gets cool, they just don't grow. And so, but when you start grading fish, especially hybrid striped bass, we we're told it's like, okay, you got to cool them down. That water, we had a conversation yesterday about drugs, and they says water's a drug. Because when you cool the fish, that alters their um, biological, it, it just, it's a sed sed sedative. And uh, when we first started, we checked our well and everything, and we checked the water every day. Everything's just going great. Well, cool the water, we'd start running water into the tank from the wells, 50 degree water. It cools the tank down. The fish are real calm. We handle them, grade them. And everything went perfect. Didn't lose any fish. And about four or five days later, we started losing a few fish. And it's like, what the heck, you know? Well, what happened was um, over time, the well water changed and we're getting four or five parts ammonia water out of our well. But we check the tanks every day. There's no ammonia in the water. Well, what happens is the biofilters, each one of these tanks, the biofilter would uh, take the ammonia out of the water. So when we come back the next morning, there was nothing there. So we got through that, finally figured out we well had problems and we made some changes in our holding tanks and made a biofilter in our holding tanks. Things started going really good. Started marketing the striped bass. They got all the market weight. <clears throat> then we had another little flare up and it's called Bryzone. Bryzone is a little animal. That, uh, it's like a sponge and it, what it happened was it came from these outdoor ponds, came up with the fish. And uh, it's a little spore, you can't see it in the water. Well, in that environment, the tank, warm water, a lot of feed, everything, this little spore all of a sudden grows into this huge little ball of, looks like seaweed. And uh, it would get in the pipes, restrict the water flow and the recirculation and everything. And <clears throat> Bryzone also is like a kind of like a little tentacle, like a porcupine or something, you know, when the fish would come up and eat on it, hit on it, it, um, it's a defense mechanism, is what I've been told, is secretes a toxin to protect itself. Well, it destroys the liver of the fish, everything like that, and the fish start losing fish. And, um, it's nasty stuff too, because when I started uh, digging the stuff out of the tanks and stuff, any open sores on it, you get infection in your fingers, and then it's just big joints. And it's people, fishermen, they've had to quit fishing because of the bryzone, their hands, and they've even had to amputate fingers and hands and stuff. So it's, it's kind of nasty stuff. So then it's like, okay, we can't bring any more hybrid striped bass in. This isn't going to work in our system. So <clears throat> we made our transition to mainstream. When in Australia, that's a different company on the other side of the world, which is a little unnerving, You're dealing with somebody that you've never met before, a different company, and just finding that was a long, hard process to find it. Um, you're not sure. So we finally made the transition to Bar Monday after we shut down and we tried to clean all of our tanks out and everything. So now, instead of driving 13 hours one direction to Little Rock, we're having them flown in from Australia and they come in these bags, liquid oxygen and water. They fly into Hawaii, then LA, go through customs at LA and then they fly them into Minneapolis, we go to Delta Freight, pick them up. So like when they're charging you know, 50 bucks for your luggage when you go on vacation sometime, you understand why, because you're competing with people that are hauling freight and stuff. So the airlines have figured out a nice way to make money. So when we first started bringing in these little fish that are like 0.1 grams, we had to have uh, little net pins in our grow out tanks and <clears throat> because the fish are so small, they go out the drains. 
So we had these floating net pens, and then you had to get in the water to grade the fish and everything, and then as they grow, they really create an appetite. The net pens get dirty. You got to take the net pens and keep cleaning them and moving them and grading. It's, it works, but it's very, very labor intensive. And these little bar of money, they're, uh, they're carnivores. So when they first come in, um, you have to grade them about every three days to keep them from eating each other. And so I guess this slide here is just a little representation. We're trying different feed companies and everything like that. And, um, there's three different kinds of feed, all um, same weight, same amount of water. But, and <clears throat> that picture was taken about five minutes after we put the feed in there. So you can tell the difference of um, how it stains the water. Um, that had an effect. So <clears throat> here um, when I was talking about all the grading and stuff we had to do. We found out from a friend of a friend of a nursery operation in a prison in Louisiana that we went down and we bought this used. It had been in a prison. They couldn't get their prisoners to do the labor, take care of the fish and everything like that. So it just sat there and they had too many escapes from the prison too. So they shut the prison down. <laughs> but uh, we went down there and uh, like in August, it was like 110, 120 degrees. It was just brutal. We spent two days down there taking this nursery part, loading it on our truck. We had two semis that we loaded the tanks in, brought everything back built the nursery, got it up and going. And so this was a lot easier than bending over the large draw tanks. <clears throat> so here we're flying fish in, floating them, acclimating the water, and dropping the fish in. And uh, this works really good. But there, here's kind of going to uh, show you what happens in the nursery or even in the grow out eventually too. If you don't grade your fish a lot, that one picture right there's a fish with a little fish in its mouth and neither one made it. So um, he bought off more than he could chew, I guess, as the saying goes. <laughs> um, but we have a little sifter grater. So these bars in there will stack maybe two or three baskets. And the top one might be a nine millimeter spacing. The next one's an eight and the next one's seven. So you dump and dip net full of fish in there, you kind of shake it like a sifter. The big ones can't fall through, they go in another tank, the next ones go in the next tank. So the nursery, it, it's pretty labor intensive and a um, lot of handling and stuff. And so <clears throat> we're recor recording all the um, size of the fish, the growth, the, everything. And we're talking with mainstream what we're doing. and. Uh, they have about 13 companies all over the world that they sell fish to. Of the 13 companies, we're the only one that has blown air system. Everybody else that they deal with have a liquid oxygen system. Well, they have a growth trend where they want to be in 2013, 14, 15, 2020. When we're doing this, we were already hitting their 2020 goals. So like when Paul, we talked to Paul and he tells people, you know, he sells 3 million fish to Saudi Arabia a month or whatever. He says he's more excited about the 40,000 fish a month that he's selling to us um, just because of the growth that we're receiving from the systems of our tanks and stuff. <clears throat> the other thing that we've uh, found out through our process, um, I think Jeff's son Brent one morning or one night he had a um, bunch of fish came in. He went in to check on them at about nine ten o'clock at night. Our lights are on timers, so they'd go off and on automatically. You know, we had just screwing in incandescent light bulbs at the time. So we went in there, turned the lights on, and the whole building just erupted. And all these fish were trying to jump out of the tank, and they're 
bouncing off the nets on the top of the tank and everything like that. And uh, um, he calls me and he's like, Mark, he says, I shut the lights off. I never checked the um, rotary filter. He says, I think we might have fish all over the floor. He says, I just got so spooked. I left there. And he says, so we went in there the next morning. There was no fish on the floor or anything. But then the other thing we got to figuring out with the lights, the, every time the lights come on, it's like somebody coming into your bedroom, 2 o'clock in the morning, they throw the light on, and they're like, hey, wake up, you know? So you get that adrenaline rush, or <clears throat> that can affect the taste of the fish. So we started working with uh, Julie with uh, once lighting, and so now our lights just gradually go up and go down. At night, they never go off completely, so they get the white, the blue, and the red spectrum, just like natural sunlight, and as it gradually goes up and goes down, we learned that there's a big effect on lighting, and then we we're also doing some experimenting with, uh, we try and keep our lights during the day not at 100%, but right at feeding time, we'll turn them up, kind of triggers a feeding response, and um, then right after the feeding, five minutes later, the lights will dim down, and so, all this stuff we're just kind of learning as we're going. Uh, we did just now install a new nursery system with a rotary filter um, clearing the back there. So the old system that we got from the prison, you have to manually clean the clarifier and the biofilter. So now every gallon of water in these tanks, in the tank, every 20 minutes will go through that rotary filter, then from there it goes back into a biofilter, which that biofilter, for those 40 tanks, there's about an acre of surface area um, that removes the ammonia from the water. And the water quality is really a lot better. Um, and I, and <clears throat> I, I, um, I'm leaving out a whole bunch of stories I could tell you probably, but I'm just trying to keep it going fast. But, my point is, through all the things that we've, experiences that we've had, um, killing fish and learning and all the things that we're battling, the, there is a good um, finish. The, the bar money that we have are growing incredibly fast um, and there's a a lot of things as far as water temperature and everything feed that, you know I could share with you and tell you um, sometime if you want to come to our farm you're more than welcome to come and look and see what we're done but uh, um, you've heard a lot of it from everybody here today there's um, but uh, it's a good thing and then uh, Vera Blue guys, you know, they were doing the same thing that we did, like Al said earlier, you, you know, you have to be comfortable with what you're doing um, and do your research. Well, the Vera Blue guys, for two years, they were doing their research. They came to us um, to look at our tanks. They kind of came to the same conclusion, and so this is kind of what we're doing right now. That's the 216 tank farm. This is kind of like what uh, 24 tank farm, how we envision it. Um, with opposing flows and stuff, I know everybody has their preference to round and rectangle, but um, if you ever tried to herd hogs in a round pen, I haven't had much luck with that. I like the rectangle and it doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, that will be the beam building where we're having an open house tomorrow. People are more than welcome to come to our open house and see what we have. And uh, I don't know, let's make it short. That's our team right there. Um, that's uh, Rick Sheriff, the guy that has the uh, posing flows technology and uh, the rest of our family. So that's it.